It's always great to see that this sort of Greek amphitheater, much less aesthetic than any Greek amphitheater, however, uh, is the kind of place in which we gather to do teaching and learning. It's fabulous. I know some of you, and presumably some of you know some things about me. Um, what I do not know that most people know is that I'm a, actually a defrock historian. So, and, and defrock historians have the problem that although they do not sort of practice as historians, they have the training of history and the interest on, in history built in. It's like being a Catholic in a sense. And um, so for me, looking at higher education is always a matter of trying to understand history, is trying to understand change, is trying to understand what looks like a little bit of deja vu. Uh, you all know that Marx had that uh, notion that the history repeats itself. The first one is a drama, the second time is a farce. I think that in this country we, we defy that. History repeats itself twice at least as a drama. Um, so anyway, so my intention today is to take you down memory lane with the, with the intention of drawing some lessons and some reflections from the past. So, just follow me. We are going to go almost 20 years, yeah, actually 20 years uh, back. It is October 1997 at UCT. Mahmoud Mandani, renowned African scholar from Makerere, visiting professor at Durban Westville, winner of a Herkowitz Prize 1999 for citizen and subject, has been appointed AC Jordan, Jordan Chair in African History in 1996, and then Director of the Center of African Studies in 1997. At the time, the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences decided to develop a semester course on Africa. Prof. Mandani was invited by the faculty to design and lead the course. What followed this invitation has gone down in South African higher education history as the Mandani Affair. An event characterized first as a conflict of academic freedom in which university administration interfered and in fact blocked the teaching of a specific curriculum. The Mandani Affair is an egregious example of the conflict between the institutional curriculum and the academic curriculum, and how in the struggle between the two, the academic curriculum is more often than not at a disadvantage. The facts are relatively clear, and some of you who are old enough might remember them. Mandani was requested in 1997 to develop a syllabus for a semester-long foundation course on Africa that all students entering social sciences programs will have to take. The outcome of his efforts and the reading list for the courses were to be discussed with three other academics in the faculty and uh, that constituted a sort of working group, not a task team or not a committee, for the implementations of the new course. Now, the disagreement between Mandani and his colleagues presumably about the organization, content, and suitability of the foundation knowledge, um, took extraordinary proportions. It required the intervention of the dean, the then senior deputy vice-chancellor, and the vice-chancellor herself. Mandani was first suspended from teaching the course, and an alternative syllabus was developed by other academics. Although the suspension was lifted and Mandani was invited to teach the course as part of the team, the controversy around problematizing Africa, that was the title of Mandani's course, and its outcome, that was the eventual resignation of Mandani from UCT, has remained one of the dark moments of post-apartheid UCT. The Mandani affair pitted against each other professor of archaeology Martin Hall and Mahmoud Bandani himself. There are four papers, um, two per author, that, have been, that were published by Social Dynamics in 1998, 
that presents the two sides of the debate, and if you have time from your PC, other things, it's interesting reading. If you read the 20 papers, the 20 papers, the papers 20 years later, is it possible to recast Mandani's own characterization of the debate as involving academic freedom, administrative decision making in relation to academic standards, and the relationship between pedagogy and content. Indeed, the debate raised these issues and their importance then and now is undeniable. But at the core of the Mandani affair was an epistemological problem that remained unnamed. What constituted valid knowledge of Africa? How was the subject of knowledge defined? Whose knowledge of Africa would be accepted as valid? And in a secondary line was the preoccupation to whom and how this knowledge could be taught. Pisace egos inevitably involved in all academic disputation, it is clear that what Mandani was proposing defy UCT academic conception of Africa and of its knowledge. Mandani Silla was confronted UCT with the need to examine its own knowledge of Africa, where it came from, what its assumptions were, what were the consequences of these assumptions, and why it was important to examine critically the knowledge of Africa with which UCT's academics felt comfortable. With very few exceptions, the alternative course was entirely based on knowledge of Africa developed in the Northern Hemisphere. The periodization of the course in the alternative syllabus, a particularly thorny issue in Mandani's own argument, was as best unexamined, and the conception of African history implicit in it, it was opaque to itself. Just as important was the unacknowledged point that knowledge itself has a history, and the history of disciplines and fields of study are shaped by power relations that are themselves born in historical context. You see, these academics seem unaffected by Mandani's critiques of the text chosen in their alternative curriculum, or by the fact that they did not seem to be familiar, in other words, read, have no clue, about the debates that African academia was having around these issues. Finally, the vexed issue of whether and in what ways South Africa constitutes an exception to African colonial history, or as Mandani argued, very much part of that very history, was not simply a matter of interpretation. It was presented as a critique of South African academic establishment, both right and left. Mandani went further and pointed out that UCT academics were offering a course that was morally and intellectually flawed. The counter-argument put by the academics that the course needed to be accessible to black students who came to the university with poor schooling did not improve UCT's academics argument in Mandani's view, who were now accused of, having, of, of housing a new form of Bantu education. Mandani argument touch on, in my perspective, certainly, on three bastions of UCT's institutional curriculum. Its high standards as the best university in Africa, its progressive liberal outlook, and its intellectual innocence as a non-racial university. A close examination of the alternative curriculum found fault with all three tenets of the institutional curriculum. Mandani found the existing expertise in African history at UCT wanting and hired since of since a consultant academic from the University of the Western Cape. He regarded the alternative course as a way of teaching black students a substandard curriculum. And finally, he served as the racialized understanding of Africa presented in the periodization and readings of the alternative curriculum. Mandani left UCT in 1998 to take a position at Columbia University. There is certainly a history to be written as to what happened at UCT during this three-year period, 
But there is no um, available record showing that the Mandani affair divided UCT or that created any form of institutional examination. It is as if this was a passing moment, soon digested by the, that, by the institutional curriculum and then expelled from the body of the institution. Almost 20 years later, under the banner of RMF, there was a call for the university to implement a curriculum which critically centers Africa and the subaltern. By this we mean treating African discourses as a point of departure, so addressing not only content, but languages and methodologies of education and learning, and only examining Western traditions insofar as they are relevant to our own experience. This is taken for the RMS manifesto. Now, how the Mandani affair illuminates RMF and more generally the call over the last three years for the decolonization of the curriculum. What are the institutional conditions that will avoid today uh, our call for decolonization or the call for decolonization ended up as a blip in the institutional, uh, on the institutional curriculum like Mandani's was? What needs to be done for the institutional curriculum not to strangle opportunities for change and reflection. And in order to answer these questions, I think it is important to try and compare the two moments. Despite its publicity, the Mandani affair was a UCT institutional issue that died fairly quickly. The issues raised by, RM, by the RMF movement had national proportions. Mandani, unlike today's UCTs, VETS, Rhodes academics, did not have an institutional power base or sufficient, if any, student support. The Mandani affair was kept strictly within the parameters of an academic dispute. RMF was a political protest that took on academic matters. In the period 2015-2017, all universities affected responded to the RMF protest and its variations, making way to conversations on the need to decolonize the curriculum. In 1998, UCT closed ranks against Mandani. After RMF, some academics actually heeded the call for the decolonization of the curriculum, and the very program of this conference suggests that there are a whole lot of people who are working in rather inventive ways about this. It seems then that the main elements in avoiding the institutional curriculum digesting a new academic curriculum are institutional support and the development of a critical mass of committed academics and supportive and active students. In other words, the hegemony of the institutional curriculum needs to be deauthorized from inside the institution. Yet, I would argue that while this is a necessary condition, it is not a sufficient condition to respond more fully to the call for the decolonization of the university. I believe that another important condition is to solve or at least understand the obfuscation between identity and knowledge forced on the students by the institutional curriculum and try and work to disentangle this relationship. Black students' demand for recognition, as expressed during the RMF protest cycle, conflated ontological and epistemological recognition and often <laughs> reduced decolonization of the curriculum to its Africanization. The origins of this obfuscation are in the power of an institutional curriculum that failed to see students and to see itself historically and sociologically. The historical failure of most histor historically uh, white universities to comprehend the implications of the presence of black students and black academics for that matter in their campuses in terms of the valorization of blackness, especially of being African, denies students and academics the possibility of developing the three components of, that are necessary for recognition in honest terms to take place. These are self-confidence, self-respect, and self-esteem. The valorization of African knowledge and by implication of African beings, which is implicit in the Africanization of the curriculum, is surely the necessary negation of the African colonial condition, 
characterized by Achille Mbembe as incomplete, mutilated, and unfinished. As important and urgent, unnecessary as this is ontologically, the Africanization of the curriculum as proposed by RMF, by the RMF movement is epistemologically and politically isolating. This for me is the fundamental limit of an identitarian approach to pedagogy and curriculum. Instead of this, I would like to propose following Mbembe, a pedagogy and curriculum of presence. This represents an affirmation of the students and their blackness, of their self, their bodies, their identities, and in particular, their inter intergenerational knowledge and their direct experience of the world. This requires a counter movement, the acknowledgement of the identity and the position of those who teach, as well as of white students in their privilege, but also in their lack. For change in the institutional academic curriculum to be profound, socially productive, and actually worth it, it must not only focus on black students and black academics. If the university is to play a truly transformative role in our society, a pedagogy of presence should help all of the university's inhabitants to recenter themselves away from white mythologies creating the possibility of the development of a new intersubjective relationships, new forms of learning, and new respect for different modes of knowing. A pedagogy of presence, then, will force the entire university establishment to revise notions of student learning and reconsider the manner in which students are taught. This has implications, among other things, for the language of instructions, the modalities of teaching, the notions of assessment, and the understanding of the student as an individual and autonomous self. At the curricular level, a pedagogy of presence makes possible two important intellectual movements. The resizing of European knowledge and its provincialization in a global world, and the incorporation of other epistemological traditions, African, Chinese, Indian, Latin American in the horizon of global knowledge. Together, these two movements provide a unique opportunity for a more radical understanding of the decolonization of the curriculum, which focuses clearly on the social critique of the world in which we live and is therefore politically more helpful. Hopeful, sorry. Now, where do we go from here? Against this background, I would like to call on all of you as critical agents to try and defy UCT's institutional curriculum. First of all, by challenging our self-satisfaction with the current notions of excellence. The fact that we are the top research university in Africa and figure high up in world rankings does not make us into a top-rate university in teaching and learning. If we want to call ourselves excellent, we need to stretch our notions of excellence to teaching and learning and sort out a number of problems. Problem number one, academic success at UCT is uneven and runs along race and class privilege. The interface, problem two, the interface between the psychosocial and the academic world of the students is mediated by a number of services and administrative infrastructure, some of which provides a poor service, and some of which operates as if the other did not exist. Problem three, we have a curriculum whose content, pedagogy, and organization require revision because it doesn't seem to be suited to our students. Where do we focus? First, First stretch is the development of collective sense of common purpose around a student's success and the student experience. Second stretch is to initiate at departmental level, that is academic responsibility, curricular reviews that challenge the institutional curriculum and follow the critical impetus of the last few years. Third stretch is the development and centralization of data analytics capacity and the institutionalization of the use of evidence to modify practice. Third stretch 
is the infusion of what we have learned in three decades of working in foundation courses and academic development into the full curriculum of the university. Force Stretch is accepting once and for all that learning how to teach is not an optional aspect in the life of an academic. So here's my invitation to you. Let's shake the complacency of being the top university in the country. Let's use the extraordinary talent that resides in every faculty to stretch our notion of excellence to one that is more critical of itself, more encompassing, and deeply rooted in the moral imperative of transformation. Thank you very much.